Reverse mortgage real estate investing. So if you're investing in residential real estate, if you're buying properties off market, those that are not listed by an agent, at some point you're gonna come across a seller who has a reverse mortgage. What do you do? We actually see this from time to time. Investors kind of freak out, right? They don't know what to do. They start Googling what is a reverse mortgage. Well, we're gonna share with you the steps on what you should take anytime a seller has a reverse mortgage. And then for those that are creative real estate investors, sometimes they ask, can I, can I take over a reverse mortgage subject to? And, and not as common these days, but can you do a short sale on a reverse mortgage? We're gonna talk about that as well. And as usual, like all my videos, this is not a regurgitation of something I've watched or I've read elsewhere. This wisdom comes from the real world. And with our accumulated experience between all the apprentices that I work with across the United States and Canada, as well as my own experiences, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of deals, ever so often we run into a reverse mortgage. And over the years, we've learned some great lessons, and those will be shared here in this video. So let's get started. The first step when dealing with a seller that has a reverse mortgage is to get the payoff. Now, why is that so important? Well, it turns out that the amount owed when someone has a reverse mortgage is not always so obvious. So let's say you ask the seller, hey, how much do you owe on your property? And they say, well, I don't really know. I have a reverse mortgage. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're just incredibly uninformed and stupid. It might be because they have a reverse mortgage and it turns out a little more complicated to know how much is owed. So let's take a, a brief uh, digression into how these, these reverse mortgages work. So it can be done in one of three ways. When you do a reverse mortgage, you're typically going to be something in the range of 50, maybe up to 65% LTV. That's the total loan amount that you're potentially going to be able to get. It depends on your age and there's some other requirements. So. Already, when, when someone gets a reverse mortgage, they're already getting a reverse a mortgage that is uh, far lower than the total value. And then they're either going to get that paid out in the form of a lump sum, which could be, again, 50 to 65% less some closing costs, uh, or they could get a monthly installment instead. And so that, of course, creates the confusion of uh, what point in the month or in the, in the set of installments that this borrower is. And then in some cases, it's a, it's a line of credit. All right, so the sheer fact that the payouts are, are different creates a little bit of confusion because this, whatever was recorded in the public records as to the total amount is not necessarily going to be the payoff because of the monthly installments. But there's one more part to this, and that is interest. So right now, I'm just going to put a round number here of 5% interest. It's going to be higher than the, uh, the prevailing rates um, because it's, it's kind of like a hard money loan. They're lending the person money based on the, the value of the property, not necessarily on the person's ability to actually get a loan. So you now have this accumulating because remember, the borrower is not making a payment each month. So this is accumulating on top of that loan amount. So that's why when it comes to the payoff, the seller doesn't really know. And why is that so important when you're buying properties? Well, it's because typically a seller is thinking in terms of how much money is going in their pocket. And that's typically how we're negotiating too, right? We're not negotiating necessarily based on purchase price. We're saying, um, how much do you need to get out of this property in order to, uh, to sell it? And of course, I use phrases like, what's the absolute least? You wouldn't be happy with it, but you'll live with it to get rid of this property. And so they're thinking in terms of, of how much is going in their pocket. Well, if you don't know the payoff, you can't even start there. So this makes the negotiation with a, uh, with a reverse mortgage a little more complicated. Now, if they're getting a monthly statement and it's showing the payoff, that makes it a little bit easier. So what you do is you can either make a phone call or you can get an authorization to release form executed and send it to the, the lender to request a payoff. Now, you think you're done, it's easy, right? Well, it turns out it's actually sometimes hard to get a payoff. We've dealt with this so many times. It's weird. These reverse mortgage companies, sometimes they just ignore your payoff request. It's bizarre. I mean, we've literally had to get attorneys involved to force them to give us a darn payoff. And it's usually when the borrower is still alive. Very different once the borrower passes. So real quick, as far as reverse mortgages, once the borrower passes away, there's usually a six month clock. I'm gonna talk more about this in a moment. but. 
it's a lot easier to get the payoff then. But while the borrower is still alive, for whatever reason, and I, I don't know, and y'all watching may know all the inner workings of it, uh, it is hard for us to get payoffs, so you have to force it sometimes. And you might say, well, I'm not going to spend a bunch of money on an attorney to order a payoff for a seller that I don't even have a deal under contract yet. Well, um, I would recommend one of those prepaid services like LegalZoom or Rocket Lawyer has a version. Or uh, There used to be a company called Prepaid Legal. It was a, a multi-level marketing company. They changed the name to Legal Shield. I don't know if they're still uh, around or not. But a prepaid legal service is something that every investor should have because it, it, it's nominal per month and, and it, can, it can handle some of these, these smaller legal matters that uh, that way you're not really coming out of pocket much to, uh, to get moving. Okay, so number one, step one, is to get that payoff. And, uh, and make sure you understand the payoff when you get it. Unfortunately, uh, it's really concerning for some of these, um, these elderly borrowers. Uh, sometimes they don't make their tax and insurance payments. And so the, uh, the uh, reverse mortgage company does, and then they charge interest on, and penalties for having paid that. So you will have to take a look at that payoff. But ultimately, at the end of the day, because there's so much equity, it's pretty rare you're going to negotiate a reduced payoff. And I mentioned that in some cases, short sales are done. Real quickly, I'll say this. Absolutely, you can do a short sale on a reverse mortgage. You can attempt to, at least. The problem is, so often they have an enormous amount of equity. Because if this is what they got the loan at, you know, let's say 10 years ago, the real estate value has gone way up since then. There's usually so much equity in these properties that it's very rare to do a short sale. We have done short sales on reverse mortgages in our history, but I can't think of, of one we've done in the last eight years. Step two is you need to understand the timeline of reverse mortgages because that plays a role in what you can or can't do in this purchase process, especially if you want to go creative with subject two. So here's how it works. Uh, as long as the borrower is able to keep up with taxes and insurance, the lender is not going to foreclose or not take the property back until after the, uh, the, the passing or the person moves out. Person moves out, all of a sudden they've got to sell it, or if the person passes away, then the uh, heirs, administrators, they're the ones that are going to have to pay off that, that reverse mortgage. Uh, but uh, otherwise, the other problem is for many of these seniors, if they can't keep up with the taxes and insurance, uh, they're, they're being foreclosed upon by these, these, um, these reverse mortgage companies. And so those are some of the examples where you might deal with sellers uh, that are looking to sell with a reverse mortgage. But usually it's because there's been a passing and now it's the heirs, it's the spouse that now wants to sell this property. So here's the timeline. Typically it's going to be six months from the passing, six months from the move out they have to sell. Plus, you can request an additional six months. That's the typical. So it ends up being 12 months. But it that might sound like a lot of time. It just isn't in the real world. When someone passes away, there's this, this period of time of grieving and of trying to figure out what's going to happen with that house. And then after that happens, then you have to deal with what's called probate. And here's what's key. When when someone owns a property outright and they're in their latter years, they're oftentimes going to do some form of uh, adjustment to their estate, such as moving the property into a living trust or setting up a, a, a quit claim deed where they have a life estate, but after they're passing, it automatically transfers to that other individual. So when you have this period of time prior to passing, a lot of adjustments can be made so that when it comes to real estate specifically, it's very easy for the heirs, the, the ones that inherit that property, to easily sell. However, when you're doing a reverse mortgage, the person's uh, name is going to be the one on title. And so, almost without exception, it's going to require probate. What's probate? All right, that is this legal process by which a judge is determining who's the rightful owner of that property, along with making sure that the estate has paid all their other debts. And that's why it's really been set up that way. Because all these debt uh, collectors, let's say there's cr uh, credit cards on that deceased person, and then they own this, uh, this home um, free and clear, they want to make sure they get paid out as part of the equity from the sale of that property. So probate is used when someone's personal name is on title at the time of passing. Because what happens is the title is still in the name of that deceased person, and technically it's now in the estate of that deceased person.
So with reverse mortgages, you're almost unanimously dealing with a, a situation of probate. Probate can cost several thousand dollars and it can take several months. And sometimes the heirs don't have the money for that. So when we say six months plus six months and we think, oh, you have 12 months in order to, to get this property sold, well, you may not get to this thing until later in the stages here, and then you might still have to get it through probate, and so you may only have a few months before uh, they can initiate foreclosure. Now, I know we're in COVID's foreclosure moratorium right now, so a lot of things haven't been foreclosed upon. I understand that, but when that expires, and some of you may watch this video long after that has, uh, has expired, there is gonna come a point where you've gotta be cognizant of that foreclosure uh, uh, initiation. Now, it does take a while for a property to foreclose. So just because the initiation starts at the 12-month period doesn't mean it goes to foreclosure right away. Then it could take another six months beyond that. But you do need to be cognizant of this because what ends up happening is if, a, if a, um, an heir or a set of heirs does not have the money for probate, what we do is we negotiate a deal with the seller well, whereby we're going to pay for the probate and then it comes out at the closing um, that we get reimbursed. And then what we do is we negotiate with a probate attorney to not get paid until the closing and all we are really out is some of the court costs. And so it's, it's a relatively low cost to control that deal. But be aware that in many cases, if you're dealing with someone who's passed away, that's going to have to go through probate because of reverse mortgage, it, the title was staying in their personal name. And so now you've got to deal with the probate process. And, and again, it's, it's, it, it, it can be time consuming and it uh, obviously could have the, uh, the other problem of the person who you thought the heir was actually isn't. Someone else comes into the picture and kind of blows up the whole deal. That's happened to us many times. It's just a cost of doing business when you deal with probate. But, um, be cognizant of that. And then your timeline is six months plus six months. Now, to get this plus, uh, typically they have to request it. It needs to be this, uh, and I forget the exact phrase, but it's it's um, it's a party that, that has the authorization to request it. It could be obviously a spouse, but even if it's an official heir or a, um, an executor of the will and, and those kind of representatives, they have to request the six month in order to actually get it. Otherwise, they will initiate that foreclosure after six months. Which brings us to doing a subject two on a reverse mortgage. And if you don't know what a subject two is, I've got other videos that explain exactly what that is. So what you need to be aware of is the timeline, right? If you do a subject two on this, you've got to do it quick. Get on title, get it fixed up, and get it sold. None of this long-term stuff. Because the other problem is, if you say, well, Phil, the, the borrower's still alive, and so I don't necessarily need to pay off this reverse mortgage because there's no there, it's a lump sum. There's no monthly payment. It's just the interest is collecting. I can collect all the cash flow. This is great. No, as soon as that borrower moves out, these reverse mortgage companies aren't playing around. They're going to know because you're going to update the title. They're going to know from the insurance. They're going to know that this person has moved out. And as soon as that happens, they're going to start this clock. So your subject to would work so long as it's very, very short term. If you think you've got this creative way around that, you will soon discover that they are going to initiate foreclosure after that six month timeline because they're going to argue that that person moved out. But yes, do we do subject twos on reverse mortgages? Absolutely, we've done many of them, but they're always very, very short term. We know exactly what we're doing. We're taking it over. We're doing that quick remodel, that cosmetic fix up if necessary, or sometimes not even doing that. Put it on the market. We're in and out in a month or two. We're not hanging around. And we have already ordered a payoff we know that the lender is easy to get a payoff from because otherwise you get stuck in this quagmire and they won't provide you a payoff for months and then th that buyer walks and this happens and that happens and now all of a sudden you run out of your timeline and they uh, and they won't give you a payoff. So I hope that helps with subject twos. It can be done, but you got to be careful. All right, y'all. Well, uh, this, there's not much more to reverse mortgages as it relates to investing. Uh, I'm not going to tackle the subject of whether or not your grandmother should get one. Uh, you know me when it comes to um, uh, rental property, investment property, you're, you're bringing in a cash flow. I'm a huge fan of getting a loan on that. But as it relates to your primary residence, you better be able to make the uh, taxes and insurance payments if you do a reverse mortgage. Otherwise, grandma might lose her house. All right, y'all. Well, I'm Phil Pustiovsky with FreedomMentor.com. I'm a full-time real estate investor and mentor to many of the most successful real estate investors all across North America. If you want to learn more about how we do what we do, uh, I've got a book, How to Be a Real Estate Investor. I give away for free on these videos. 
download that, read that. It's absolutely fantastic and giving you a, a great brief overview of what we're doing with creative real estate investing, how we're so successful, regardless of the market conditions. Uh, right now, people ask me a lot, is now a good time? Now is the best time to be a real estate investor in my entire lifetime. It's never been better. COVID has created such an amazing environment for what we do. Low inventory, low interest rates, huge demand. Every time a property goes on the market, it's a multiple offer situation. If a buyer gives us a hassle, we just get rid of them, put it on the market again, get a higher buyer, and away we go. It has been an absolute boom for our apprentices and I. But we also know how to get to properties off market even better than real estate agents. So we're getting to deals before anybody else is, and that is the concern concern people have. Well, who's selling right now? There are a few people selling, not as many as normal, but there are, and we're getting to them, and, and we're creating some amazing deals, even if we don't negotiate the lowest possible purchase price. Uh, we're, we're getting deals under contract a lot higher than we used to, and we're still making huge profits. All right, well, if you want to learn more about how to work with me and my team, that is my apprentice program. You can learn more there, more, uh, learn more here. And uh, if you want to learn more about the basics of creative real estate investing, that's what this video here is for. All right, thanks so much for watching, y'all. Post any comments or questions you may have, and I'll see you in the next video.